just going to be a little bit brief, I think. I wanted to take up um, Actually, some of the things that, that Alexander and Leona brought up, I kind of wanted to, to follow up on to some degree. But uh, the main focus I wanted to get at was that, well, let's, let, me, let me go back a little bit. You know, uh, Alexander had mentioned people thinking, oh, we can wait, let's talk about November, let's talk about the election in November, um, which is pretty funny because given the fact that Romney, who, you know, was being touted as, so, you know, he's going to be the Republican candidate, Seeing how he's no better than Obama, waiting in November to get somebody who's no better is really hardly a good idea. Like, oh, don't, don't worry, we'll get a different bad person in November, and then we'll have to say we have to give him a chance. So it, was, it would actually be, it would be worse. It would be worse. No, I mean, the idea, the only way, the only way you're going to get something done is through impeachment. You can't wait for an election on this. The other thing is that, you know, Diane had made this point that having an election doesn't make people better. So if you've got candidates who right now stink, how is getting votes and being put in the White House going to make them become a better person all of a sudden? Aren't they going to be the same person they already were? Maybe worse? So I just, you know, I, yeah, like I'm going to wait for November for it to get worse. Then, you know, then, then, then what do you do? Um, so, you know, and as being said, I mean, it's, it's over right now. I mean, this, the, this food... Uh, crisis is very serious. There's an excellent video uh, by Lamari on the website right now that goes through how what might seem to be natural disasters or natural climatic changes like El Nino, etc., end up creating famines at times where the creation of the famine is a political uh, a political decision. This video is on there. Yeah, it's up on the on the website now. I, you know what? I listened to it while I wasn't looking, so I don't know what the name of it was. <laughs> Yes, there you go. Um, uh, oops. Wow. Huh? Oh, yeah, it's part of food. I don't know how that could have been my train of thought, but it did. Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> Got it. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, the idea that, that famine is a serious issue today is itself completely absurd. We know how to make food. It's not a big mystery. We've been doing it for a long time. There have been a number of advancements. These advancements, that they work other places. I mean, if you bring a fertilizer and tractor to Africa, they don't sort of not work because of the geomagnetic situation there or anything like this. No, it, it, we, we, we know how to do these things. The fact that there's famine, that there's potential for famine anywhere on the planet right now, is because a decision was made for it to be the case. These things don't happen. The fact that there's poverty, it has to be intentional. I mean, how, how could by accident the United States be in worse economic condition than it was 30 years ago? Did things like that just happen? Of course not. There are, even if, even if many people aren't making plans, there are people who are making plans. Now, the oligarchical principle, this isn't new. You look back at the, the, uh, the Greek story of Prometheus, it's told by Aeschylus, where Prometheus gave mankind the gift of fire. And it wasn't just fire. If you read Aeschylus' play, he gave uh, astronomy, he gave number, he gave poetry, he gave animal husbandry, he gave advancements in agriculture, he gave science, he gave reason. Now that gift of, uh, of reason, which we have as human beings, that is itself what is hated by the oligarchical principle, where the fight isn't about, sometimes people say, well, the United States is run by corporations now. No, it isn't. General Motors isn't running the United States, okay? Blackwater Security is not running the United States. Bechtel, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm probably forgetting some evil corporation right now. That securities firm that that senator was involved in, you know, whatever it was called, that's not running the United States. Goldman Sachs is not running the United States, okay? There, yes, corporations exist, but they're not running anything. I mean, you'd think if these corporations are running the U.S., they wouldn't all be losing a huge amount of money and not turning profits, okay? so. The fact is, it's not these individual entities that are trying to make money. The point is, what is the governing conception of the human species? That's where the fight is. It's not about who's going to get more money than somebody else. Okay. So this oligarchical principle, that's the, the fight that we're uh, up against right now. And it's been with us for a very long time. And it's time to get rid of it. It's like if people still wet the bed when they're adults. That's something you need to, you need to get over. Better late than never. You know, if anyone here has that problem, that's just get over it. That's, we won't worry about how it took so long. 
Same thing with the human species and the oligarchical principle. Let's get over it. It would be helpful to know why it took so long, but it's not something that we're going to accept and continue to live with just because it's been that way for a long time. The idea that some people run things and they do it in a way that's not best for everybody, well, why would that be tolerable? Why should that be acceptable? Why, why would we have anything less than a society that's running the best possible way? Or at least trying to. You know, people make mistakes. I mean, even when you try to do good things, it happens. So the, um, the idea here, the difference between us and the animals, the difference between free human beings and those who are living in an enslaved manner, as the uh, oligarchical uh, intention would have, is the ability of us to go beyond our senses and go beyond the world as presented by our senses to figure out how it actually operates. Because that is the tool, that's the gift that we have, that's what makes us able to survive as a species and able to evolve uh, in very short order compared to the animals. Leona had showed the, the, the chart, so I'll put it back up. Leona had showed the chart of biodiversity over time. So as she said, over 500 million year period, we've seen a, an overall increase in the number of genera of, of life on the planet. And as she also pointed out, after the big extinctions that take place, after the mass extinctions, the kinds of animals, the kinds of life that take over in the wake of the destruction of you know, a vast majority of different kinds of life on the planet, the new ones are always of a higher order. You don't just sort of get a when people try to explain these things, scientists try to say, what's the cause for this huge reduction? 90% of all species on the planet are gone in short order, okay, but over like 10 million years period or less. They say, well, something must have caused that. An asteroid striking the Earth. A, a large number of synchronized volcanoes that all started spewing everywhere at the exact same time. Shifts in the plates, you know, uh, slight change in the Earth's orbit, things like this. Now, if that was the only cause, if it just kills a bunch of things, well, why is it that what comes up later is always better? What's, what's making that happen? Is this just survival of the fittest? Is this just that uh, things that happen to be slightly better somehow do better than others? How is it that you develop, do you ever, like imagine, let's take that approach. Let's take the survival of the fittest approach. Let's apply it to music, let's say. Let's say somebody's got a song, and everybody, you know, they really, really likes the song, they're always humming it, it's a really popular song. Let's say somebody changes it a little bit, they have a mutation. You know, a cosmic gray hits them. When they're humming the song, you know, they got some gum in their mouth or something, they sing the song, it's a little bit different. People say, you know what? I like that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds better. I don't want to be seen humming that other song. I won't be able to, uh, you know, uh, find a mate and reproduce. I'm going to sing, I'm going to hum this other song. It seems to be the way to, you know, to get along. You know, and then, you know, and so everyone's humming this, and then and something's a little bit different. You know, one of the other notes changes. So when you hold it a little bit longer, you change one of the words, people say, well, you know what, that doesn't really sound very good. That's just not that constant. That's, that's bad. And then that person goes extinct. <laughs> they jump off a bridge, I don't know. They're really sad, no one likes their song. Now, if you just kind of kept doing this, and you get these little, you know, little changes in the song and whatnot, how do you really get a, do you really get a new composition that way? Do you get a new idea that way? Like when you think about it in your own life, in your, in your own mind, when you've really thought something that's really fundamentally new, was it just a slight change of something you thought before? Did you get to it by slightly adjusting your earlier thoughts? Anybody? Is that, is that how you get like a really brand new idea? Yeah. Improv. You get improv. But, but think about, let's not take jazz music as the example. Let's take the, the, as the example getting fundamentally new ideas, but if you've experienced it, um, it's new. It's not a variation. Sometimes a little variation is nice, you know? You put a little bit of extra cream in your coffee one morning. It's a little fun. That's different than, you know, than totally shifting things. So, you know, if you take the example of music, if you take the example of your thoughts, it doesn't happen that way. It's a new thing. Now take a look at life. We're not talking about just small changes here. Like, you know, after the mass extinction, you know, all of these kinds of animals go extinct, and then there's a rise of new animals that are all the same except they're pink. That's not what happened. 
you get new introductions of new biological technologies in these mass extinctions. So, you know, just some of these, which have been, which are, you know, they're gone through in the report, we've gone through in some other good videos on the website, things like, um, things like having fruit. You know, plants, if you take a look at, uh, this is why pine nuts are very expensive, is that, uh, I don't, I don't remember much, I don't know, I don't know buy them, but, okay, they're expensive, good, compared to like an almond or something. Yeah, it's because pine nuts are gymnosperms. They're, so they're, they're not plants that are, you know, in the process of making, you know, big amounts of fruit. If you compare it to angiosperm, well, I guess these are both kind of nuts as opposed to a fruit, but if you wanted to have a diet and you're only able to eat things like pine nuts, here the financial cost is sort of good measure of how, you know, how easy it is to make them biologically. How much money are you going to spend if you're surviving on nothing but pine nuts? As opposed to if you're, the only thing you're eating is fruit, you're on a fruit diet, so fruit and nuts, let's say. So you get your cashews and your apples way cheaper that way. It's much more biologically productive in making food available for other species that might need that kind of energy. So if you've got a bunch of mammals going around, they're burning up energy like nobody's business compared to the reptiles. Reptiles, if it's cold, they're cold. If it's hot, they're hot. Very energy efficient. You know, it'd be like saying, just uh, throw your thermostat away and you'll save money on your bills at home. <laughs> it's true. You're not going to have to pay for heating or air conditioning. I wonder how your life's going to go, though. I mean, you know, if you're if you're sick, that could kill you. You know, I, well, you don't have to be sick. To, I mean, that, that's yes. When it's really cold, that's bad for your health. So, um, the investment that was made in mammalian life takes a lot of energy to keep the body in, in a static condition. Um, this is oh, but incidentally, this is why I put up my put up my hands. Okay, so, but it does allow new kinds of. Uh, things that weren't possible for the reptiles. Beyond the fact of being able to do things at night, you know, I, 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 you know, you picture like an owl that's hunting at night or something like this. Does anybody know of any, I might be wrong, I'm not a nature expert, but does anybody know of any reptiles that are particularly active in the middle of the night? Possums? Possums? It's not a reptile. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, reptiles. reptiles. Oh, so, okay, if I did, I meant, okay, reptiles, reptiles. <laughs> I'm, well, now I did say reptiles, so let's just, yeah, okay, but, yeah, so snakes, they're not known for being all that active at night. Um, lizards, nope. Mm -hmm. So, um, also, you're just actually able to have biological processes that you couldn't have, because they, they, they depend on a constant temperature. I mean, imagine, let's say you're thinking about something, and it's, you know, it's, it's evening, and it's getting cold, <laughs> your brain slows down, and so you're talking to your friend about something, you go for a walk at night, and you say, uh, uh. <laughs> and then the morning comes around, and you say, what were you saying? I don't know. <laughs> so you've got, there, there's, a, there's an advantage, the extra energy for having a mammal, it's worth it. You got something out of it. Um, so, okay. Now, I wanted to use, there is no, I should have, okay, I should have and made sure that we had a whiteboard. I didn't, so that's my fault. So I had a couple examples I wanted to go through. I'm just going to go through, uh, through one of them in detail, and I guess I'll sketch out another one. Was uh, I wanted to talk about what, what, how we can think about these real kinds of changes. Actually, you know what? Actually, I'd rather even not have a whiteboard now. I've already, already, already thought I'd find out differently. <laughs> uh, plus, it's a good excuse. If this doesn't work out, it's because I didn't have a whiteboard. Okay. <laughs> so how do we look at these kinds of real shifts? And I want to look take a look at what I want to focus on is quantitative versus qualitative changes. So uh, are people familiar with those words, quantity, quality? So maybe a quantitative shift might be, you know, changing that one note in the piece. What's that? How many numbers? Yeah, how many? As opposed to what kind would be a qualitative shift. So um, what I want to, so that's what we're going to look at. That's what we're going to look at. When we look at economic growth, um, when we, we see what human beings do, oops, another graph. No, oh, there we go. This looks a lot like human population, or at least somewhat like it. I'm just thinking that it goes up and it has its bumps along the way. When we do this, okay, imagine now that this is actually a chart of human population. I don't have one, but let's pretend that it is. If you look at human population, let's say around, 
and you look at it, say now, there's two. There's definitely some differences that are taking place. There are more people now, right? We never had seven billion people on the planet before. Are they the same people? Right. I mean, now are they different in quantity? Is it just because, like, you know, you know, we had Jim back then, and now we've got Joe or something? Or is it? Is it I mean, obviously they're different people. People didn't live for that long. But they're, they're different kinds of people. That is, when you're, when you're using population, LaRouche in his, uh, in his economics textbook, So You Wish to Learn All About Economics, um, that's the name, he says that a very good measure for how you're doing economically is your potential population density. How many people could you support in a given area of land or on the whole planet? And things like, you know, water treatment, agriculture, fire, these have all increased the potential population density of the planet. The other point, though, is that it's not the same kind of people. So let's take the, if you take the period from, let's say, the Renaissance through the Apollo program, there's obviously a lot more people, and the kinds of thoughts people are able to have are also of a higher quality. Right? The people still can make, I mean, people could have been creative anywhere along the way, but the culture, I should say, has changed. The, the culture that people are existing in is a more powerful culture uh, if it allows people more easily to have conceptions that are really worthwhile. And if you've got a culture that promotes thinking about uh, sex and uh, losing weight and gambling, I don't know. That's mostly, yeah, that's what you find on the internet, you know. <laughs> a lot of the ads are, and refinancing your home. Um, that's not a very good culture. That's the, where's the important stuff, you know? So, okay, so quality and quantity. I'm going to use an example of, um, I want to take a look at different kinds of, okay, here's some experiments. Right, let's turn the lights off for these, actually. Wait, don't look at Oh, okay, well, All right, are there more uppercase letters or lowercase letters? Buddy system, you can think of 
married couples, however you want to think about it. But we got we got we got pairs, we got pairs here. And then we got one single little G <laughs> by himself. Okay. That was for fun. To help us get it get it at this point I wanted to make. I want to talk about uh, about infants. Because it, in one way to look at, one way to get out of quantity is to just start by saying we're going to look at infants. Then there's no more quantity involved, or quantity is less obviously involved. This is going to help us look at qualitative changes. So here, I didn't have time to write them all out. Um, nobody does. Here, so here we got all the numbers, right? One, two, they just keep going, and they'll, they'll keep going on forever. How many numbers are there in this, this concept? I'm um, not, not written on the screen, but this whole idea of just going on forever. How many? Infinite. 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 Right. Okay. Now, let's say I just took the even numbers. Okay. So, right, I've only got two and four, so no one, no seven. 15's left out, 19's gone. How many, how many numbers are there here? Infinite. Same infinite? Bigger, smaller, equal? Same size infinite? Well, less different infinite. Less infinite? Half is infinite? Because, so let's, let's go back here. Right? I mean, we said there are more blue than red letters because we've got a blue that isn't associated with the red. Here, I mean, I you know other people think differently about this, but I've definitely run to a lot of people who said, well, there's more red numbers. Because, yeah, look, they both got two, but I've also got one. Here, both have four, but I also have three. So there's a whole bunch more numbers here in the red than in the blue. And that's, I mean, not, I, mean it, I wouldn't see any reason to reject that offhand. It seems like it's, this is maybe one half of infinite. <laughs> now, what if we rearrange them? Like with those letters. Remember, with the, the letters got much easier to, you know, at first it was tough, a little easier, way easier, very easy. Here, we're a little bit of a disadvantage because we didn't write all the blue and red numbers in. Like with the letters, I had all the letters I was going to draw on the screen, they were all there. Here, I only wrote some of them. What if I uh, write them a little bit differently? What if I just connect each even number with the red number that is double, that is twice. I think that if you think about them this way, you would have a very hard time finding a single red number. Because before, oh, you know, we had we had one, three, and five. They were up in the red, but not in the blue. Well, one, three, and five, they've got their markers. We got the buddy system and one there. And I don't think anybody could name a red number that doesn't have a blue buddy. How about 101? It has a blue buddy, right? 202. Any blue number I name, it's going to have its red part. So I'm going to make the claim that it's actually the same infinite. But let's see, maybe we can, maybe we can find a bigger infinite. Because there's a lot of numbers. Has anybody ever run into a number that wasn't the whole number? Somebody else? Fractions. Okay. I've run into them too. Let's take a look at it. Don't worry, they were okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, so here we got one, two, three, four, five. That, that goes on forever. Now we've got all the halves, right? One, two, three, four. Okay? That goes on forever. Here we've got the have nots, also known as the thirds. They, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right? So the thirds, they keep going on. The fourths, the fifths, the sixths, the sixths. It seems, it seems like each one is an infinite. And then there's an infinite number of the rows. Okay, how about now, what if I said that this was actually was a bigger infinite? There's more, I didn't write any of the red numbers up here, just the normal whole numbers. Would anybody believe that there are more fractions than whole numbers? More? Yeah. 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 Anybody not believe that? All right, good. <laughs> no, yes. I'm going to do the same thing again, though. I'm going to, I'm going to reorder them. I'm going to reorder them. 
I'm going to take this uh, fanciful way of walking across the fractions. Because when I look at them before, I went one through five, and then I guess I'd have to go forever, and then I'd you know, hit the, you know, come back on the typewriter and start going on this row, and I'd come back. Instead, I'm going to go across them diagonally this way. And then I'm going to label them with the order that I reached. No. Don't worry, I've only got a, a 30 more slides on this, okay? I'm just <laughs> so, I think that if you look at them this way, if you order them this way, like when we put the letters together and made them easier to count, I think that every blue fraction has a red number that's its, it's part of it's balance, it's bloody, whatever. But there's no single blue number. They might be blue, but they are married. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I think once again, this is still the same infinite. And maybe there's only one kind of infinite, it's possible. I'm going to take a look at another one, though, because here's the, here's the funny thing about infinites, is that as we saw with these ones, infinite as a word isn't all that descriptive. Does anybody know what infinite comes from? It's etymology, where the word comes from. <coughs> What, what is so in and then finite? What, what does in mean in the front of a word? Not like um, like mother. What well, should we just say? Like I can't think of one right now. Incorrect. Incorrect. Yes. Yes. Incredible. Unbelievable. Yes. Um, okay. So in is not, and then what's finite mean? Yeah, like finished. Exactly. Right. So these are rough. They're not sanded or lacquered. These are, sorry. Okay, I'm not going to make any more bad jokes. That was my bad <laughs> Not willing, not, not knowingly. Um, so infinite just means it didn't end. There's a lot of things that don't end. Let's look, instead of the fact that it doesn't end, let's look at what we're doing that doesn't have an end. So, I mean, the way of, I mean, making fractions is a little bit different than making numbers. Making even numbers is a little bit different than making whole numbers. But they still all have the same sort of size. I'm going to see if we can find something where we can actually get a larger size. Let's take a look. Because we've also left out, has anybody ever seen a number that wasn't a fraction? Zero? Irrational? How about like the, uh, the square root of two, for example? Um, I think I'm not going to go through it right here, but you know, the square root of 2 isn't a fraction. There's no, it's, you can show that it's actually impossible for any fraction to exist, which if you square it, you get 2. So the number of square root of 2 is nowhere on this list. Maybe we should include that number, too, if we left that out. Um, how about uh, pi? The ratio between the circumference of the circle and its diameter. That's not a fraction. It's not a square root, either. Same thing. Tough kind. Well, I made a list of every number that exists in the whole wide world, okay? But now, to save space, I only wrote the first five of them up. Okay, now that's a lot of numbers. If, does anybody need medical attention? Anybody just have a heart attack? <laughs> okay, it's dark, I can't see. Okay. So here we've got every number in the world. We've got, we got pi. we got, oh, it looks like some big ways. Okay, what's the second number? Yes, it's the base of the natural logarithm. So more on that later. This is a friend of the cat here. Okay. Uh, the golden section. It is. It's the golden section. And then I forgot the fifth one was, but maybe somebody else did. It was. I changed one of the numbers too. So anyway, but then okay, so. Anyway, I made this list. It's got all the numbers in the whole wide world. It goes on forever. And I just went ahead and instead of making it a puzzle, how do the red numbers get associated, I just sort of labeled them. It's just like an index. So every, here we've got all the numbers, and here we've got their label. Again, their partner, their buddy. Now, I'm going to make a blue number that doesn't have a red partner. So here's the, here's the trick for doing this. 
Um, and this is not, this looks like numbers and things. This isn't mathematical, okay? Here we go. So the first digit of my first number, pi, is a 3. 1 isn't 3. So I'm going to make a new number here. I'm going to start filling it out. And no, it's not the same as my first number of the list, because 1 isn't 3. The second digit of the second number is a 7. For my new number, I'll make it a 1. 1 isn't 7. So I know just looking at this digit, that it's not the same as the second number of my list. It's not the same as number number 2. The third digit of the third number is a 1. <coughs> so for my new number, I'll make it a 2, just so it's different. So I know only looking at this one digit, it's not the same as the third number. All I, that's the only thing I know about this. This 8 isn't a 1. I know that my new number is not the fourth number in my list. The fifth number, out of 1, I made it a 2. It's not the same as the fifth number in my list of all the numbers that exist. Now, this new number that I'm making, I can't actually make it, because I'm going to have to go on forever. But I could have made it. So what I think is that this is a perfectly legitimate blue number that doesn't have a red partner. In other words, even if I had a list that was infinitely long of all the possible numbers, this number isn't in. And there's a lot of numbers that weren't in it. I just used ones and twos. Go back. I could have made this thing anything but a 3, and it wouldn't be the first number in the list. I could make this anything but a 7, and it's not the second number in the list. I make this anything but a 1, and it's not the third number in the list. Anything but an 8, anything but a 1, anything but a so on and so on and so on, it's not in the list. So, I've got a single this is 1, but there are many single blue numbers, where even though the list is infinitely long, doesn't include everything. Now, I mean, this we can definitely come back to in the question. I just know when I when I first when Phil first showed this to me, I was like, it took me very long. It definitely didn't make any sense to me. Because so I know this is a very weird concept we've never seen before. We can definitely maybe just to go through it again, try a little bit. But, and the but, well, actually, let me just ask right now. Are there specific questions about? Should I just go through the whole thing? Again? Well, anybody have any questions? Or we, we can come back to it. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, keep going. Okay, not a problem. So, um, so this is, I would say this is uncountable. That there is an infinite that's countable, where I can associate it with all, with the, with the original whole numbers. And that here, I've got an, un, I've got, if I think of all possible magnitudes, it's uncountable. It always exists outside of whatever I think I've got. In a certain way, if you, if you use a trick that, that Gödel used in proving that Russell was totally wrong, you can turn this into saying that any state of knowledge is incomplete. Because uh, every possible, with, with the Gödel language, with that, that secret language trick that he uses to turn any, okay, this is a, print, this is a footnote here, okay? Any, yeah, any, um, Gödel, in showing that mathematics could never be finished, used a really smart trick where he turned the language of mathematics into numbers so that every mathematical statement would actually itself be a number, which could be then put into another statement so that you could refer to mathematics itself and everything was a number. He used that to prove that there was a truth that mathematics couldn't prove, to make the point that, that mathematics is incomplete, that logic just, logic can't, is not the key to discovery. I just want to make a note here that the number of mathematical statements in, that are possible in Gödel's language is countably infinite. Which is so. This is another way of saying that there is more, whatever whatever your current state of knowledge is, there always exist more concepts that aren't included in it. That we're never going to be done discovering things. Um, so that we've got this is an example where we've got. That weird number was like this lowercase g here. Um, okay, let's get the lights back on. And then, 
sketch out uh, something on the second example on geometry here. Um, okay, so another example of different kinds of infinites would be there we go. Different kinds of infinites. Um, the number of I have used this before. You know, if you, like, again, let's take that population graph as a matter of fact. Again, pretending it's human population. So we're back in the time of Egypt and the pyramids. Infinite number of things that that culture could have done. Infinite. No limit to the number of things they could have done. I couldn't have a list and say there were exactly 302 different things that the Pharaoh could have had his people do. There's no, there's no limit to the list. However, could you go out and pick me up some french fries at McDonald's was not on his list, right? Or I'm sick, could you get me some date bill? Not on the Pharaoh's list. So, you know, today, again, there's an infinite number of things we can do, but it's a bigger one. It includes things, although, I would not maybe build the pyramids today, but it's a, di it's a different infinite. And if, you know, as long as we don't forget anything, past, if we keep, you know, if we don't forget things in the dark ages, it'll always be a bigger infinite. So, infinite being sort of the domain, not being defined by how, how big is it, how can you count it, but what's creating? What's creating this infinite? What's creating another kind of infinite? So, as a quick example on that, I wanted to take up uh, the space and um, space and geometry really briefly at Riemann. So, uh, Bernard Riemann, as I probably most people are so much familiar, Bernard Riemann, uh, in 1854, wrote an incredible paper where he proved that mathematics couldn't discover anything, and that space, that the idea of what space is like, wasn't something for mathematicians to try to figure out with ink, but something for physicists to figure out by doing actual experiments that didn't involve just writing with a pen on a piece of paper. So, in doing that, he had he made the point that what people take for granted about the way things work in space is full of assumptions. For example, you know, if, if I you know, if I take two two points in space, I can say I draw a line between them. How would you ever know if your line was straight? And, and let's, let's maybe you've heard this before, but take it as a serious question now. Could you give any? How would you say that you knew it was a straight line between two points? If it wasn't curved, we'd know it was straight. That's the only thing that's going Okay, how do you know if it's curved? Yeah, how do you know if it's curved? It, it may be curved in a certain amount, but it's so infinitesimal that you cannot... No, what I mean is how do you know whether the line is curved? What? How, how do you know whether it's curved at all? Well, this line is limited. It doesn't extend well, let's take it. Let's take a real example of going around on the Earth. So we got it. We got a navigating culture. A boat. You go over here. You figure you went in a straight line. Did you? Could you possibly have gone in a straight line? Well, no. As much as we know about the Earth right now, it's curved, isn't it? Goes Well, you don't have to go around the whole Earth to know that it's curved, right? <laughs> I mean, here it's curved, right? It's round. Yeah. However, to know if that's the case isn't necessarily an easy thing. It's not like saying, oh, this, you know, here, this line's obviously bent, and this one looks pretty much straight to me. Yeah, you actually, that, that, was, that was a tough question. Just how would you show if the Earth is curved without going all the way around it? That's a real question. So it's not a trivial idea of saying, is something curved or not? Or is something flat or not? How do you measure whether, I guess if you had a very a completely straight line, you could then you know, determine whether this wall was flat. But again, where, you know, where would you buy the ruler? How would that ruler be physically produced? It wouldn't be with some guy saying, yeah, it's not curved. If NASA, if NASA relied on that to make the mirrors for space telescopes, it wouldn't, you know. 
two micron tolerance, looks good to me. You know, you have, you have to actually, you know, have somebody to introduce that. So what Riemann said is that a lot of times people end up thinking about whether a line is straight or curved or something like that, and they're ignoring the question of whether the space they're in is flat or curved. So, because if you are, for example, let's say you're a light beam. Now, we think light bends. Light goes into water and it bends, which is why, you know, the spoon and the iced tea looks like it's bent or whatnot. The light is the things that's going in a straight line. So, you know, we're by, we, us being outside of it and not being beams of light, we can see a distinction between how light moves and what we think is straight. Figure out why might that be happening. So, the, the, just the point I want to get at there is that when you've got spaces, I mean, this is, you know, this is most clear, you know, Einstein really, you know, actually, you know, used this significantly in his general theory of relativity. So, you've got a lot of examples of curved spaces, curved space times. The, a different kind of, Here's where I want to get at. A fundamentally different curve space is a qualitative change as opposed to a quantitative one. Like, let's say I took, so here, here's what, imagine this, like, it's on a whiteboard or something. <laughs> so let's say if I had a globe, if I had a, you know, just a sphere, and I turned it into an egg, is that a qualitative shift, a quantitative shift? Well, it, it, I mean, compared to just changing the size of it, you might say it's qualitative. Let, let me bring up another example. How about taking that orange and squeezing it a little bit flatter, so it's like a filled donut. All right, so we've got like a flat thing here. And then actually pop, popping a hole in it and making it to a, a bagel shape. Now, the bagel compared to the sphere, is that a quantitative change or a qualitative? definitely was, is even more qualitatively different. Here, here are some of the differences in it that are you could only think of as being qualitative. Um, I'll give you an example. Like, let's say you have a, uh, if you have a sphere, in case you know what it looks like, okay, there's a sphere. Actually, you know what, I got a picture of a sphere. Thank goodness. Yes. Okay. So I got my sphere here. Um, now if I so if I if I draw a curve on the sphere, I you know I close a region on it. Um, also, if I cut along the sphere here, it's now going to fall apart into two pieces. There's a red piece and the blue piece. They will actually will fall apart. They're not connected anymore. <coughs> Let's say I had a bagel. Wow, this is really nice. I think that. Okay, we're a good looking tourist. Let me try that again. Okay, great. So here's our delicious bagel. Here are the raisins. Now. I can make a cut on this bit. I'm sorry, but it's, it, there's no thickness. It's just the outside shell of the bagel. You got, if you bought it into a store and you got a hollow bagel. You got a bagel shell. Well, but it's got to be a, but it's like a tube. Like, a, like if you took a hose and you just put it, you wrapped its ends to each other. Something like that. Like, it's, yeah, a short tube and then next, you wrap it around. Now, if I took this uh, torus here, and I drew a circle around it like that. I don't have, I couldn't color one piece, I don't have a blue piece and a red piece now. What I would have done, I would have had my torus, I would have just basically been like cutting it here and then I unwrapped it and I've got it too. I don't have a blue piece and a red piece. I just have one piece. So that's something where it's not, that's not like a quantitative change, like you change it one note in the song or something like that. This is just, that's just fundamentally different. So a circle and anything you could smoothly turn it into without popping holes in it. So like a, sur uh, a sphere or an egg. Again, an egg. You draw a circle on an egg, you're going to have one part you can color blue, and one part you can color red. Two different parts. If you've got a torus, um, there are, there's some ways that you could do it. 
When, it, for example, if you had a little raisin sticking out, you just drew a little circle around the raisin, you could say that's red and the rest of it's blue. But it is possible to draw a circle that doesn't separate the torus into two parts. In fact, after I drew this one circle in the torus, now it's folded out into a two, I could, uh, oh, this is supposed to be behind it. I could then imagine like moving along the top here. Sorry, let me just draw the two. So here's the two. If I just cut a slit like that, it's not a circle. But anyway, this is interesting too. If I cut a slit like that, I would unfold it and unwrap it. It's still not two pieces. You're right, um, but then the second cut would have been a knot circle. <laughs> this one would have been a knot circle. If you do it the other way first, yeah, it's this. Anyway, that's that's the only thing I wanted to do with that was to, and there's gonna be, I'm going to get into some more on that later. That's sort of where um, that's what Riemann did with the Belian functions. Anyway, I don't have anything else to say about that right now, but that's sort of in the uh, in the works is getting some more rubrics or good, better concepts of what qualitative differences are, because the kinds of changes that we may, need to make in the economy aren't quantitative ones. Like anybody who's saying, well, how will this Mars mission, um, how will it close the budget deficit? Now, maybe that's not the worst question in the world, but if you were, and it would, yes, it would certainly close the budget deficit, because you can make the whole economy grow, you're not going to have a budget problem. But if you were trying to say, how are we going to get some more money to solve, close this budget hole, the most immediate way to do that isn't going to invest in a long-term project if you're trying to do it right now. Right? But it's still the right thing to do. It's, it's a, it's, it makes a qualitative shift that we need to have. So overall, this th that ability of making qualitative shifts, like the animals do, not willfully, but as we're able to do willfully, that's got to be the basis of morality for human culture. You want to, you know, there's lists of do's and don'ts. I'm not saying that they're necessarily all bad or anything like that, but it's a lot easier sometimes to write don'ts than do's. The kinds of things that we have to do are things that haven't been done before. It's hard to put in a list. Hey, discover something new. Okay, how? Can I get a how-to guide? Some of them are easy. Don't commit adultery. Okay, I think I know what that means, and I know whether I'm doing it or not. That seems really straightforward. Make it, you know, figure out something new, um, now, could you give me a list? <laughs> yeah. This is a lot tougher, and it's that, that's the kind of feeling that we have to have. That's what it is to really be a, a, a human being. And that's the sort of thing that, that just oligarchism doesn't exactly like. So that's why you get the benefit of promoting sort of very immediate, ugly cultures where you're not really thinking about how to do something new. It's sort of like, you know what? I don't want to do something hard like go to Mars. I could just... If I want to have fun, I can just, you know, go to a casino or or get some porn on my computer, you know? I, that's if I want to have some fun, that's what I'll do. I don't love going to Mars. I'm, you know, I'm uncomfortable. Mm. You know, so, you know, I'll always have the stay-at-home types, but but the human beings will be, will be moving forward. So, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, we certainly can't. This will not, just in case anybody was wondering, this won't happen with Mitt Romney's election in November or something. In case you were you're under the yeah. delusion that this is like, I was actually telling you like Mitt Romney's economic program or something, and then, no, <laughs> right? So the only, the only way this is gonna be a possibility is getting Obama out quickly before the election. Uh, also another thing, Frank, that's the only way you're gonna have another candidate. So, uh, just on a nuts and bolts level. So, uh, okay, that's what I wanted to say. And now, go back to that complicated thing, rather than the Leon and said too. <laughs> you know what, let me see if anybody, let me just even wait and then see if anybody else is going to on this in that, okay? Please? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
So if you suppose the idea to them that if we get Obama out, somebody, we don't even know who, someone may step up to the plate and actually be a patriot or a human being and um, take the place, take his place in the election. And then you see people go, oh, yeah, well, who would that be? Well, did we know him before he became Senator Obama right. and then President Obama? I don't know who the dude was when he was Senator. Right. So it's like, why are you so concerned with who that might be? It's the idea that somebody's out there, that there is, are people waiting in the wings that are actually human beings, patriot types, that would love the idea of him being gone so they might be able to step forward. And then, if you want to really talk about, you know, the, the real logistics of it, we could have a primary, and maybe these other types could, you know, like show what they're like or what they are about, and we could pick one of them. Yeah. Okay. So it's like you see people's wheels turning because they're so stuck in this candidate can beat the the Republicans. Why can't some other candidate beat the Republicans? Maybe even more than them if you want to stay in that stupid Republican Democrat nonsense, you know. So just even on that level, think about that. If he's gone, somebody else might actually be able to step up and say, I'm a true patriot, I'm a true American, I'm for the American system. Vote for me. That's yeah. what I have to say. Yeah, you because it changes the context. Yeah, because a lot of people say, well, oh, Someone will get Obama out. Now, if the context isn't kicking him out first, we already got what we got. We got some Republicans that are running against him. So if you don't do anything and you wait for another choice, there's your choice, not a choice. So you know, it's, it's just like if, you know, you've got to be active in it. If you're you know, if you're waiting, like oh, let me see what choices I get or something. It's just that's not that's not living like a like a citizen. Really, you know? the other thing also that Mr. Roche points out is that. With, the, with this insanity determining the level of discussion, you can have the clown show you see with the Republicans. Can you see clearly? Yeah, just that you can, you, with, with an insane president, you can actually allow a clown show to occur as our election. <coughs> and that, that's, that's acceptable. And one thing that Mr. LaRouche had pointed out is that some of these people might be not crazy who are running for Republican or, or would run for Democrat. But the environment is such that it, it, it allows, yeah, it allows an entirely insane discussion that's absolutely outside of reality. And so then you can get out of the particular, are there good people and so on. You set a standard. We're gonna kick Obama out because all these things, he's destroy the Constitution and all sorts of things. And that's going to set a standard for discussion uh, amongst all your candidates. And then you can start to say, okay, well, you're gone, you know, you may be good, and, and, and so on. But you, you, you create that type of qualitative distinction. You know? yeah. Listen, I mean, if any of these guys are qualified, they would call for impeachment. That's the thing. You know, it's like like a, you know like Obama had recently done this recess appointment of I think like the Consumer Protection Board or I forget what the position was, but he did a recess appointment while the Senate wasn't recessed. So now what do the senators say? Well, we were in a launch investigation. Of this this is you, know, you don't need to launch an investigation. What he did was against the Constitution. So you know it's like if you're if you're, if you're sitting there if you're a federal representative. You're saying somebody got to do something about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's your job. <laughs> you know? So yeah, this, yeah you know, it's, this is a job that devolves on us because it, it's not, and it's not just because well the leaders aren't doing it, therefore we have to. It's really it's not a different thing. If, if as a citizenry we're not, if we don't have active ideas of where the country should be going, then we're failing. We have to have a concept. Where do we want to go? Not. I'm going to choose one of these things. You personally, do you have an idea of where the country should go? If you don't, you have to have one. Otherwise, how are you going to expect? How are you going to expect it to, to get anywhere? You, gotta, you have to have. You have to have an idea of what success is. Do you have a question? Well, I, I was wondering. The guy no, 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 no. Stop. Uh, 
Bliss? Okay. Uh, I guess, uh, Talk to you. thing is to say to be very flat out that nothing that is being considered right now as an alternative or the choice will work and it's one of those things that's funny because you'd like to maybe you'd like to not say that because then you want to you don't want to put people down you don't want to get them depressed and so on they already are they actually know that already yeah they actually know that already and but they're still trying to, because these are supposed to be the only choices, you have to choose one of them. And, but be really flat out, look, none of it's going to work. It's not going to work. It's going down. And then, then they'll probably ask, well, why are you standing out here then? Right? Do you have something else? Why, why aren't you depressed if you think everything's going to go down? And I think... I know from, from experience that people are ready for something totally outside the box right now. This is, it is a situation where, you know, it's, it's not, there's no advantage to clinging on to anything right at this point. Clinging on to a party or even greenyism, you know, or anything that you normally cling on to to make decisions politically, there's really no incentive to cling on to them right now. It's, I, I, what it seems like to me is that those are the things that have been posed as their choices. And if we make very clear that not only do we know that all those choices don't work, but we have another, we have a higher way to look at it, then we just have to know that. We just have to know what it is that is the higher way to look at it. I mean, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, we go into Congress, we talk to these supposed bigwigs, and it's, some, it's somewhat scary because you come in, you know, we had this, there was this water conference that, or water panel that we actually missed. Um, we caught it on, on, the, uh, on the web. At the end, the senator was saying, boy, wouldn't it be really great if we had a large water project that was already planned out. <laughs> I just want to say that, you know, really? You're a senator and you really don't know anything? Or, I mean, there's a several occasions where we're coming in with a policy and they don't have one. So, you just, you just get a clear sense, and it's sort of scary, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's opportune, maybe. 
that there is a there's just a big vacuum out there. Uh, there's no one making the decisions. There's no one up there that knows something. Like you've heard, like they are up to something. No, they're, they're not up to anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, we've been to, I, I know that myself, I've been to a couple of different, I went to a, a, a military event with all the big wigs, CIA, defense, Pentagon, and so on. And they're out there discussing uh, strategy. So they call it the Grand American Grand Strategy. Grand American Strategy. And their whole point for many of the conversation, con uh, the presentations was that no one knew what Grand American Strategy was. That was the point. You know, we just put out this paper on planetary defense, laying out how you would talk, think about defense of the planet. I mean, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, we're not we don't have any stars and so on. But you just get a sense, like, well, these are our our big shots here. These are they, right? Up there. Well, let's, let's, let's say, I just want to say a quick thing on that too, which is that, uh, is that uh, sometimes, well, you are right, that was kind of a little bit, so I'm not sure if, but um, being really straightforward with things can work fine. Like, you know what? We have a complete economic breakdown. The only way to address that is to go to Mars. That's a true statement. Now, you know, what the senior you're talking to, would they, would they have thought of that? Would they think that that, oh, of course, oh, that's not what it's no, of course they won't. They're gonna say what? And then you'll start talking to them. But I mean, but, but you know, you don't have to. Um, a lot of these things, it's 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 there's not really a very good segue. In other words, I guess what I'm saying. <laughs> it's just like you know what? We have to impeach President Obama. You know, <laughs> it's tough to you know being around the bush on that one. I guess. So, let me. You have a quick one. Yeah. Yeah. This is on extinction. Several people have come up with a theory that since the Terran system has a north declination relevant to the uh, relevant to the galactic equatorial plane, that this is a sufficient level where it's a high probability gravitational effect of the northern hemisphere from the center of the galaxy. The black hole, what they say, is in the center of the galaxy. That this could trigger between the years of, of uh, 2012 and 2014 or so, an extinction event um, because the Titanics in the northern hemisphere affected by the position relevant of the sun in the center of the galaxy. Okay. You know what's crazy though? Now, this, this has been gone over. There's a number of different things out there. But some astronomers have put this forward. What's your position on this? What do you think? And what's the probability of it? Well, there's no... Because we haven't studied our jurisdiction yet. I say if we don't go to Mars, we wouldn't even know if that was true. Well, I mean, these cycles, I mean, look, yes, these extinctions are obviously correlated with large galactic cycles. The exact mechanisms of them are unknown. So there are people who say, well, it's because of the different amount of cosmic radiation coming in from this direction. That's a hypothesis someone puts forward. It's because of a different gravitation in this position. That's a hypothesis somebody's put forward. Now, there is absolutely no possible way with cycles of this length to pin down a two-year time interval. I mean, anybody who's saying that is just making things up. It's just, it's just not possible. There's no way. In other words, nobody knows exactly when this is going to go down. Well, no, yes, and yeah, but not, not in that specific of a way. I mean, these cycles are like 62 million years long. So if anybody is telling you they know a 62 million year cycle down to 2012 to 2014, <laughs> especially when it's suspiciously close to right now. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> There's a few red flags on that one. I, 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 if you want to keep yourself up at night, you know, worrying about things, I wouldn't. I wouldn't make that one of them. <laughs> I'm not up at night. Okay. All right. All right.
Yeah. I think on that note, we should give them a great.